a really small church, and uh, you just talked really loud because we didn't need a sound system. I was up in Danbury, New Hampshire, up in the middle of nowhere. All right, so I'm pretty sure even though it's been months that I've been going through the book of Jonah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have covered more chapters than Rodney has, So even though there are long gaps between them. So, but in, in uh, his defense, Jonah is a very small book. I'm pretty sure there are chapters in John that are longer than all four chapters of Jonah put together. All right, so we're going to pray, and uh, then we'll dive right into it. Lord, thank you for your word. Um, Thank you that we get to study it here freely and to focus on you. Lord, we thank you that you have laid out a plan of salvation through each one of the pages, all pointing towards the Messiah that we can now look back at and see his life and the way that he lived. Lord, please be with me as I deliver this message. Um, Ultimately, Lord, let it be your words coming from my mouth and your Holy Spirit working through me uh, to properly divide the word of God and to explain uh, the life of Jonah and the ways that you show him mercy and grace just like you show us mercy and grace. Ultimately, through your son, something that Jonah didn't get to experience and see, but we can now experience and see. Uh, through the New Testament, Um, his sinless life as we go through the book of John, learning about him and learning about the way that Jesus loves sinners and loves us ultimately uh, enough to eventually die on the cross for us and cover us of all of our sins through his mercy and his grace that we did not deserve, Um, we deserve to hell. But Lord, you have given us so much. Thank you for this church and for their willingness to serve and to come and worship you. Help us to have this entire day and our whole week to be focused on you and your word and to meditate on the things that we've learned here today. In your name, amen. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of an overview of the previous sermons because it has been a while. since we went through those. So uh, just real quick for Jonah chapter 1 and Jonah chapter 1 the idea was running away from the will of God. Uh, Obviously God told hey my will is for you to go to Nineveh and preach repentance because or else I'm going to destroy them. And Jonah went the opposite direction, went on in his day, was considered the other side of the world. He was heading towards a Tarshish, uh, which is on the other side of the Mediterranean. So you really, if you looked at a map of that time, you really couldn't go any farther from where God wanted him to be. He was going as far as humanly possible. If he knew about the uh, New World, he would have sailed there, I'm sure. He would have been like, I'm going to the States, Um, because he was just trying to avoid God and avoid God's will. And we know that obviously God, um, through the use of a big fish, eventually brought him to Nineveh, whether he liked it or not. In chapter 2, we talked about this idea of not being spiritually prepared until it was too late. So Jonah was a prophet of God. He's mentioned in Kings um, as a prophet, and he's mentioned here as a prophet. Um, But he wasn't spiritually prepared. God told him, hey, I'm giving you a mission. Go preach to Nineveh. Tell them that their wickedness is come to the point where I will destroy them and tell them to repent and turn to me. And Jonah was not spiritually prepared for that. He was not in a good relationship with the Lord from what we can tell from the word because or else he would have listened to God, right? If you're in a good relationship with your heavenly father, you'll do what he tells you to do. Jonah decided to do the opposite and ended up getting swallowed by the fish, and it wasn't until he was in a horrible situation that he was finally like, okay, God, I submit, I'll do what you want me to do. So he was not spiritually prepared till it was too late. If he had just told God in verse 1 where God tells Jonah, hey, go to Nineveh, preach repentance to them, tell them to repent, and Jonah had done it, We could say Jonah had a great relationship with the Lord. He was ready for the mission that God had called him to do. Obviously, that didn't happen, and we get the story of the fish. In chapter 3, the main thing that we 
pulled out of that was the idea of genuine repentance. The fact that Jonah in chapter 2 wasn't very repentant during his prayer. At no point does he say, sorry God, I should have listened to you. I will follow you with my whole heart. He is more of like a wishy-washy prayer of, yes, I will fulfill my vow and do what I'm supposed to do as a prophet. But I'm not that sorry. Like, we don't get a very repentance uh, prayer there if you read chapter 2. It's pretty like, I was in a bad situation, thrown into the water. I was going to drown, and God, thanks for saving me. I guess I'll go do what you want me to do. Um, But in chapter 3, we see a very repentant Nineveh when Jonah finally goes there after God literally dragged him by the belly of a fish to Nineveh. Um, When he finally goes there, Nineveh is extremely repentant to the point where everybody in the city, maybe there were a few stragglers, but it sounds like it's pretty much everybody in the city, the king, and even the animals. He tells not only the people to repent, but the animals should fast too. So they were very legitimate about their repentance. They realized that the God of Israel was the one true God and could back up his claim. I mentioned during that sermon that obviously they could look back, Nineveh could think, hmm, what are some of the things that have happened to previous cities that God has said he's going to enact judgment on? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah got blown up by fire. Well, Egypt got destroyed by ten plagues. Well, Jericho, its walls got knocked down. There's a list of dozens of different encounters that they could see, encounters with the one true God and how he could back up his claims for destruction if they didn't repent. So they genuinely repented. So that brings us to Jonah chapter 1. Chapter 4, we already did. Let's just start over again. No, that brings us to Jonah chapter 4. Um... And so this, I think, is extremely sad, this first verse here, um, because the whole point of Jonah's mission was to get these people to repent, and then we'll see um, his reaction here. So if we go to Jonah chapter 4, starting in verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So what was he angry about? Well, we have to look at the previous verse. Chapter 3, verse 10 says, Then God saw their works, talking about Nineveh. So he saw the fact that Nineveh was repenting, they were fasting, they were very brokenhearted at the way that they had been acting, and they were turning to the one true God. They destroyed their idols. They were focusing on um, the real God instead of these make-believe things that they had created. Verse 10, Then God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So why is Jonah displeased? If this was youth group or Sunday school, I'd ask the kids, and the answer would be, because God saved Nineveh. That's why Uh, Jonah is really angry, exceedingly angry, it says. So he, I'm sure, was red in the face. He was hulking out. He uh, wanted to see uh, Nineveh get smashed. All right, so let's continue. Jonah 4, 1 through 3, we're going to read. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed. He prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it was better for me to die than to live. It is better for me to die than to live. We already looked at, I believe it was chapter 1, how Jonah was so frustrated that God brought this storm on his ship, the ship that he was traveling to Tarshish on, that Jonah's like, all right, there's no way out of this. God's going to make me go to Nineveh. So instead, what I'm going to do is make these sailors toss me overboard, and I'll drown, and then I don't have to deal with going and doing what God told me to do. So this is another time when Jonah's like, 
suicide. It's the only answer. I'm just so upset, so sad that God has brought this upon me. Just kill me now. So he's a miserable dude. We're going to talk about that quite a bit. And we're ultimately, uh, this sermon, we're going to be kind of talking about the whole of Jonah uh, because it all kind of ties together into one story. I believe Rodney was talking about this uh, last Sunday when Megan and I listened to it, the fact that there were no chapters, there were no verses in the Bible, so you would just read the whole thing straight through. All of Jonah ties together um, if we just read the whole thing straight through. So we'll be looking at that as well. So God's mercy, that is the reason why Jonah didn't listen to God in the first place. So back in chapter 1, 1 through 2, God told him, verses 1 through 2 say, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Further wickedness has come upon me, uh, come up before me. So in chapter 4, Jonah heard that and thought, well, if I actually go and tell them to repent and they actually do it, God's going to show them mercy because that's just how God is. So I don't want them to be shown mercy. I hate these people so much that I don't want them to survive. They're an enemy of Israel. They're the enemy of God's people. I'm one of God's prophets. I'm not only a child of Israel, but I'm also one of his prophets that he speaks through. I am special. They're not. They should be destroyed for attacking our cities and being at war with God's people. They're horrible. I've heard of the things they've done. He's maybe seen some of the things they've done. And he's like, I don't want God to show them mercy. I'm going to hop on the boat. And so Jonah gives us here in chapter 4 his reasoning behind it. It was ultimately hatred towards Nineveh and being like, God is so loving and kind, of course he's going to save them if they repent. But I don't want them to repent because then God's going to save them, so I'll just hop on a boat and do the opposite of what God wants me to do. He, of course, asked God to kill him right after that, um, which he's like, if I don't get to see Nineveh destroyed and I have to deal with looking at this city and seeing them burn their idols and turning to the one true God who I've been following my entire life, I'd rather just die because these people are horrible. They don't deserve the mercy that God's giving them. So something I want us to think about, and we're going to talk about this near the end, um, but just kind of have this running through your head. I think a lot of times we read the Bible and we're like, well, that's an interesting story. Well, that's a character from the Bible, or this is a, a person from the Bible. But I want us to think, and I try to do this when I read the word, is this is a human being. This is a real person. He had parents. He had thoughts and emotions, and he had maybe siblings. He had a life, and we need to not think of him as like, oh, Jonah's just some wacky character that somebody made up and wrote a story about. This is a real living human being that lived a long time ago, but still has the same fears and problems that we have, right? He still struggles with his faith. He still deals with fear of going to a nation that has slaughtered his people. So let's just be thinking, it's not a fairy tale. Jonah was a real man. And also, when we get to this point where God relents from this horrible city and Jonah's like mad about it, and we think, oh, Jonah must be such a horrible person. He did not want to see all of these women and children and men and livestock and all these people die. How dare he be mad about that, that God showed them grace? I want us to also think through history, there have been people, and maybe even ourselves at some times, that have struggled with that, of like, that person really didn't deserve to, they deserve the death penalty, or they deserve this for the atrocities that they have done. So it's really not far-fetched for somebody to feel mad about something that they find is an injustice. But I think it can be surprising that it's coming from the Bible, which there are a lot of bad people in the Bible, but it's coming from the Bible and it's coming from a man that is one of God's prophets. So a lot of times when we read the Bible and we learn about God's prophets, they're doing amazing things like, um, parting seas and 
blowing things up with fire uh, against the prophets of Baal and just doing amazing things for God. Whereas Jonah, we see his story and he's just miserable the whole time and lacks faith and struggles. But Jonah, in some ways, I feel like we can relate to a little bit better than some of these men that just have such a pure, hard faith for the Lord and serve him. Jonah is almost a little more of a American Christian that likes his cushy house there in Israel, likes his cushy house here in Eaton, and doesn't really want to go outside of his comfort zone. He's happy where he is right now. I'm serving at Cornerstone Grace Church. This is where God wants me. He better not call me over to Russia to preach repentance to them because I'm comfortable right here. I, I can speak the language. You people understand me. You're not going to shoot me for what I believe. I'm comfortable here. Let's think about that as we think about Jonah and finish this, uh, this book. In chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, during Jonah's prayer in the fish, he recognizes God's mercy and salvation. But when I was reading it, I was thinking it sounded more like it applied to himself and to Israel than to the people that he was supposed to go preach to. So let's read those. So Jonah chapter 2, starting in verse 8. We're going to read 8 and 9. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. For I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So that verse 8 kind of stuck out to me as I was going through this sermon. I was like, what are some of the... I know Jonah mentioned God's mercy beforehand. I know he mentioned God's mercy in his prayer. But if you read that, it sounds a lot more like a condemnation for other people that don't follow God. So less of... God is so merciful and loving, and he shows mercy to people that don't deserve it. It sounds more like those people that worship idols, like Nineveh, they don't deserve God's mercy. They've forsaken it. They should be destroyed. So it's really tough reading that and thinking God's mercy should go to everyone. Everybody deserves, um, deserves to repent and to find God's mercy. Sounds a lot more like only those that I think should find God's mercy, should find God's mercy. Those idol worshipers like Nineveh, they don't deserve it. Obviously, he didn't think Nineveh deserved it because his reasoning behind going on that boat was they don't deserve God's mercy. I know God's going to show them mercy. I'm hopping on that boat. I'm not going to tell them about God's mercy. All right, we're going to continue in chapter 4. Let's go to verse 5. Did we skip verse 4? Yeah, we got to read verse 4. Here we go. So, verse 4, Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So God asked Jonah, Do you have any reason to be angry? If Jonah had listened in chapter 1, this would have been a lot simpler. The whole process, the whole story would have been a lot easier. Though all the hardships that Jonah has faced are self-inflicted. So God's like, Do you have a reason to be angry? You could almost think God could be saying, I have a reason to be angry. I told you to do something, and you didn't do it. Why are you mad? And we even know in chapter 2, Jonah recognizes that God didn't let me die in the water. He saved me with the fish. So God not only showed Jonah mercy by letting him fall into the water and swallowing him by the fish and showing him love in that way, God was the one that should be angry and frustrated with Jonah. Not Jonah, the angry, frustrated. God, how dare you show mercy to these people? So God asks him a question. Do you think you have the right to be angry? Let's look in verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. I think it's interesting, too. We don't get a response from Jonah. Jonah's in the city, just preached repentance, he tells God, I knew they would repent and you would show them mercy. And God's like, why are you mad about that, bro? And Jonah's like, I'm not even going to answer. I'm just going to leave this city. So here we go. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city where he made himself a shelter. 
and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would happen, what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was great, very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the, the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun rose that God prepared, prepared a very vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head. So that, so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Those in youth group, they know that I have a, uh, an Israel voice for when they complain. And I'm pretty sure in Jonah's voice, if you were going to give Jonah's a voice, you could give him a whiny voice. So like up here uh, in verse 3, Therefore, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And then here in um, the end of verse 8, It is better for me to die than to live. He's just he's very whiny. Verse 9 says, Then the Lord said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, Is it right for me to be angry even to death? All right. So much fun. All right. Jonah continues to make his life worse. Because the issue that he falls into is the fact that it's really hot out there and there's a bad wind. Well, where was he before? Well, he was in a giant city with walls and shelter and lodging. And instead he decides, I'm going to leave here because I hate these people so much. I'm going to leave, go sit on the outskirts of town, sit in the wilderness, and watch and wait and just hope. You know, I'm so miserable. I'd rather die, but maybe, maybe the people in this city weren't genuine. We got to remember that these people were horrible, murderous, idol, idol worshipers. And Jonah was thinking, how could they suddenly change? How could just in a few days they decide, no, the way that we've always lived, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to follow the one true God. So Jonah goes and sits up in, on a hill probably so he could look down at the city. And he's sitting there and he's like, if I don't die, maybe I'll get lucky. If I'm not going to die and God's not going to kill me, maybe I can spend at least the last moments of my life getting maybe lucky enough to see God put judgment onto Nineveh. Maybe they weren't genuine about their repentance. That's probably, that's, that's, that's what Jonah was thinking. He was waiting to see what would happen to the city. Because so far his arguments with God of like, I knew you would show them mercy, haven't really gotten him anywhere. So the only thing he really has to hope for is he's hundreds of miles away from his home is maybe these horrible people that I hate so much will finally be uh, blown up in fire, an army will come through and destroy them, a tidal wave, a great wind, God could do so many things and I'll just be here to watch, I'll get my popcorn ready. Jonah is mad, so mad at God, Nineveh, everyone, so he's mad at God, he's mad at Nineveh, he's mad at everybody except for himself. Never does he take responsibility. We see three times in this chapter alone he calls for his death. In verse 3, in verse 8, and verse 9. So he is done with it. He's sick of it. He's... He's just so over all of it. Let's finish up the chapter and see what God's response is and ultimately what the end of the book is. So verse 10 of chapter 4. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not? Pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and their left hand, their right hand and their left hand, and much livestock? It ends with a question, which I think is pretty fitting, because God's been questioning Jonah 
Like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be a prophet. This is what I told you to do. This is your job. It's like going into work and being like, hey, I need you to stock those shelves. And you'd be like, no, I'm feeling like doing the cash register all day. Well, that's the other end of the story. I need you to stock those. No, you wouldn't have that job very long. So God keeps asking Jonah. God is Jonah's manager. He's like, do this. Do this. Why are you not doing this? Why are you mad that you're not doing your job? You're not doing your job. Why are you mad? I should be the one that's mad. So another thing we need to mention, I've mentioned this in a couple of my other sermons, when it talks about 120,000 persons who can't discern from their right hand and their left, it's talking about young children, people that can't understand left from right, can't understand right from wrong, can't understand anything. Innocent children that were under the age to really understand the sin that was going on in the city. And so that's just the children. That's the only number that we get about Nineveh here in the Bible. So we can assume the calculations are somewhere around 100,000 people in Nineveh, if not more, um, is like a rough estimate. So that's a lot of people. To put that in perspective, um, with a quick Google search, it is roughly the same size of the amount of people living in the city of Cincinnati and Cleveland combined. So if God had destroyed Nineveh, it would have been Cincinnati and Cleveland. If you have any friends or family or know anybody there or ever been there, those entire cities just being wiped off the map. So that is a huge amount of people. We know that God shows mercy to those that trust in him. In Genesis, we see how God was going to spare Sodom if there were just ten righteous people. Let's flip over to Genesis 18 real quick, and we'll catch the end of this story. To give us some context, Genesis 18, to give us some context, God is talking to Abraham, and God has come down, he sent some angels, and he's talking to Abraham and being like, hey, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They're terribly sinful. They're horribly wicked. I'm going to destroy them. Sounds pretty similar to Nineveh. But Abraham is like, my nephew Lot lives there, and he's a preacher of righteousness. He's been telling them the truth for years. If you find he works him down, I forget where they start at, probably 100 or 50. So he starts at a number, and he keeps working down to, well, what if there are 45 righteous people in this huge city? Would you spare it? And God's like, yes, I would. What if there were 20 people that were righteous? Would you spare it? And God's like, yes, I would. What if there were 10 people? So we've gotten to the point where there are 10 people. He's worked them down here. So let's look at Genesis chapter 18, 32 through 33. And he said, let not the Lord be angry, this is Abraham speaking, and I will speak but once more, suppose ten should be found there, meaning ten righteous people, people that aren't horribly sinful and wicked like the rest of the city. And he said, this is God, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So if any of you know that story, there were not ten righteous people in Sodom, and it got destroyed. There was one righteous man, it was Lot, and God saved Lot through the use of angels. Um, They get him out of the city. So think, knowing that story, which I'm sure Jonah knew that story, unlike Sodom, which did not listen to Lot, who was a preacher of righteousness, Nineveh repented. So not just 10 people, but the entire city. So God would have shown mercy to just 10 people in the city of Sodom. Of course, God would show mercy to an entire city that turned to him. And we see that in verse 10 of chapter 3, if we want to flip back to Jonah. Then God saw their works and that they had turned from their evil ways, and God relented from the destruction which he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So it wasn't just a verbal thing or we're going to fast. It was them 
destroying idols, them turning to the one true God, them, I'm sure, uh, we don't get all the details here, but I wouldn't be surprised if the people were like, we got to find this Jonah guy. He knows more about the one true God. He's got to tell us, how do we worship this one true God? And Jonah's like, you guys are doomed anyways. I'm going to go sit on the hill till God blows you up because I know none of you are genuine. Because these people were trapped hundreds of miles, not trapped, but they lived in a city hundreds of miles away from the priests and the God's word that was in the, the temple. And they were away from all of that. So all they had to go off of was maybe some stories and then what Jonah had told them. And these people being genuine, repentant people, I'm sure were looking forward to the different things that God would bless them with. And what are the promises that, that God um, has made in the past? And Jonah, instead of being there and continually being like, these people are genuine. Let me tell them about all the great things God has done for my people and he can do for your people and the fact that there's a Messiah coming who will save us from our sins. Instead of doing that, Jonah decides to go work on the cash register and not sack the shelves. Sorry, I worked at Target, so all my analogies are, you know, store related. All right. So this is, we get to the end here. Looks like I missed a section. So I want to mention real quick, we didn't really talk about the plant. The plant here looks to me, and from what the, the, the text gives us, it's kind of an analogy or a test for Jonah to be like, hey, you're sitting out in the wilderness. You did that to yourself, just like you made yourself get eaten by the fish because you were you know, running away from me in the first place. This is another self-caused problem. You did this to yourself. But I'm going to show you grace, and I'm going to make a plant grow and cover your head. Possible that Jonah, after being in the fish, and Jonah, after wandering through the desert, after being covered in fish goo, had lost his hair. That's a possibility. He was probably all splotchy and weird from being in fish acid. So having a hot, deserty sun on your bald head would not be very pleasant. So God puts a nice plant over him. He built himself a little shelter, Jonah did, and he's sitting there waiting for the destruction of these people. And even though Jonah is waiting for something horrible, God is still showing him mercy and grace by putting a plant over his head and being like, now you're more comfortable. I'll give you this so you can be a little more comfortable and see that I still care about you. But then during the night, God sends a worm, and the worm eats the plant, so the plant dies. And then God's like, all right, you still are sitting here. You're still waiting for the destruction of Nineveh. You still haven't repented of the fact that you've been a jerk this whole time. Here comes the sun, and it blasts him, and possibly his bald head, and he gets hit with a harsh wind. I'm sure his shelter didn't stand up very well because it says that the... Uh, Sun burnt beat on Jonah's head, so he wasn't covered very well. So God uses this as a learning lesson for Jonah to be like, obviously God knew what Jonah's response was, and everything that happens in the life of Jonah and in the Bible is for us to learn from. But God shows him, and he shows us, the ridiculousness of Jonah's stance right now. The fact that Jonah cares more about this plant, that Jonah had no hand in making. If Jonah had been there like, I got some seeds, I'm going to water it, I'm going to tend it, and I'm going to make myself a nice little shrub to protect me, maybe he would have had a little bit more of a, God, how dare you? I worked really hard for that. But God, God made it. Jonah didn't work hard for it. Jonah didn't ask for it. Jonah didn't do it. But he's still mad. He's like, that thing was mine. That was my buddy. I care more, which is God's point here, I care more about that plant than I do the city that is filled with hundreds of thousands of people. I'm sad that that plant tipped over and died than hundreds of thousands of people dying. So it's God putting in perspective to Jonah, why are you mad? Why is this what you care about instead of these people? 
Why does a plant have more value than human life? All right, so we're going to jump a little bit forward again. We were just talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Jonah is not... um, Yeah, let's talk about this. So the end of Jonah chapter 4 and the end of the whole book is a really weird way to end a story. It's like if you're reading a novel and you're going through the story and like, you know, this would not probably become like a bestseller because it doesn't really have an ending. It kind of ends with a question and you never get to hear what Jonah's response was. So far in the chapter, his response was, if he did respond, was, I don't care, just let me die! Because that's been his response so far to God. But we don't get a response. And I think I mentioned maybe in my first sermon that maybe Jonah's answer, if he did answer, and it's not recorded here, when God's like, don't you care that these children that haven't done anything wrong are going to die? And all the adults are going to die? And the animals? Everything would have died in the city if it wasn't for my grace and mercy. It's possible, and knowing Jonah's character, I just have this feeling, could totally be off, that Jonah, at least in his heart, was saying, I don't care. He's like, I'm over it, don't care. And it's possible, let's, let's look at some possibilities that I came up with for how this story ends. You might have some better um, information, but from what it looks like, This is the last time Jonah is mentioned as far as like his story. He's mentioned uh, by Jesus. Jesus says, I will not give you a sign other than the sign of Jonah being in the whale for three days. Jonah being a representation of Christ in the tomb and then raising from the dead. That's the only other time he's mentioned forward. And then backward, I said in Kings, he's mentioned again, but very briefly. So Jonah as a prophet has very, very little text about him. So to this point, at the end of the book of Jonah, we don't know what happens to him. So here are some possibilities I came up with. So it's possible that Jonah went back to Israel and never did anything notable again. It's possible Jonah's like, God asks him, don't you care about these people, all these women and children that were about to die? And Jonah's like, not really, I'm going home. Possible that happened, and he never did anything else for the Lord, at least what is recorded. He was done doing his job. He got fired. It's also possible that Jonah's final response was, I don't care, just kill me, and God did. It's possible that God's like, okay, it's going to get even hotter, and you're going to die of heat exhaustion. He's like, that's, that's it. You've been asking me for it. Three times so far you tried to commit suicide earlier. I'm just going to give you what you want. And that's why Jonah doesn't respond, because Jonah's dead by that point. That's a possibility. There might be some other ones that you can think of, but we're not really told here in the Bible what happens to him. Jonah is, I think Jonah's very interesting. God uses him to save an entire pagan nation Hundreds of thousands of people worshipped the one true God because of his preaching. Jonah was one of the most effective prophets in the Bible because people listened to him. So we got to keep that in context too. The fact that most of the other prophets in the Bible weren't listened to. They were beaten up. They were murdered. They were having their scriptures burned, torn to pieces. They were stoned, all sorts of things. But Jonah, being a horrible example of a prophet, once he finally went and did what God told him to do, God used him in an amazing way and saved hundreds of thousands of people from destruction that started worshiping the one true God. So we have to understand that's not Jonah's doing. That's God dragging Jonah there. But Jonah had to physically walk to Nineveh. That's probably the greatest act of faith that we see in the story is the fact that after he got spit up by the whale, he did finally go to Nineveh. That's about all we can say, and he preached. But we see in chapter 3, 1 through 2, 
We saw in chapter 1 that God said, go and preach to that nation that they're wicked. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This is after he was spit out of the fish. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. I think I mentioned this in uh, my previous sermon, the fact that it's worded a little bit differently than chapter 1. Instead of you go preach and tell them to repent, God's like, say every single thing that I want you to tell them because so far you've been doing a lousy job. So I'm going to speak directly through you and say everything. So he was just being, pardon this phrase, I guess it's not super accurate. He was basically just being a conduit or a puppet for God. He was still doing it, he was still saying it, but God was like, tell them, you will be destroyed in 40 days unless you turn to me, burn your idols, follow the one true God, Yahweh. And Jonah went through and repeated that. So Jonah, even his message, was just coming straight from God. It wasn't Jonah being like, let me tell you the great things of our Lord. It was God doing it through him. All right, so we're going to get into some application in just a moment. Nancy is going to go through uh, some slides because I think uh, Jonah is a very applicable um, book of the Bible because it is a pretty great example of, of us even though we uh jonah is probably more relatable to us than we would like to admit we look at jonah and how he acted and we think wow he's a total jerk a monster and so rebellious against god so we're going to go through some questions that i've made um, of things that jonah has done so that's one of the first ones jonah has done and we should answer jonah did that have i ever done that have I done the opposite? And kind of see how we compare to Jonah. So the first one, which is up there, and you can write these down if you want and put a little check mark next to it or a little X or whatever to say, yeah, I've done that, or no, I'm not like Jonah at all. So first off, Jonah ran away from God, from what God told him to do, and we find that in the beginning of the book of the Jonah. And I don't know about you guys, but... I have not always listened to what God has called me to do. Has God ever prompted you, not that God really speaks to us audibly, he speaks to us through his word, but has God ever prompted you standing at the checkout or sitting in a restaurant and think, that person probably needs to hear the gospel and kind of felt that and then been like, no, they look too busy. I don't want to distract them or anything. But the Lord is just making you feel like I should probably talk to them. And then the interaction is over and you lost your chance. God had his, he was trying to push you in a direction to be like, hey, you need to share the gospel. You need to, to be in the word and to be able to share it with others. What's the point of going to church if you're not going to share it with others? And then you waited too long and you're like, ah, it's fine. I'll, I'll talk to somebody else. You know, sorry, God was running away from your will there. It's not that big of a deal. Jonah did it in a little bit more of a drastic sense. But as my analogy earlier, I'm comfortable here in Cornerstone Grace Church. If God's will is for me to go to a foreign country and preach the gospel, are we really willing to do that? Not saying that it is God's will for you, but maybe it's something like serving at church. I feel really prompted to serve in this way at church. I have this talent that God has gifted me with. Should I use that for the Lord? Well, it would be inconvenient for me. Instead, I'll just, you know, sit in the pew. So I think, at least for myself, I would check most definitely. I am like Jonah in that way. I have struggled with always following God's will. All right, next one. Jonah claimed to fear God, but was a hypocrite and did not obey the God he feared. If we look back in Jonah chapter 1, I feel like we need to read this to be able to uh, get the context of what this question is in. So Jonah's on the, ship, on the ship, the sailors are about to throw him off, and here is, they're like, Jonah, who, what god do you worship? And here's Jonah's proclamation here in verse 9. Uh, if I can find it in my Bible. So he said to them, Jonah speaking to the sailors, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. 
So he makes this proclamation of, I'm a prophet of the Lord, I follow Yahweh. And meanwhile, what is he doing? He's sailing the other direction. He's like, I follow God, woo! You pagan sinners, just like Nineveh, you don't follow the one true God. You're praying to your other gods, but I follow the one true God. Look at me, follow him as I sail the opposite direction. So he's a hypocrite, which I think could apply to a lot of us. We say, I'm a Christian, I go to church all the time, and then you don't have a loving heart towards those that are unsaved. You mess up in your language and say something that you shouldn't when the Bible says have no corrupt speech come from your mouth. There's all sorts of things that we can show ourselves as hypocrites as well. Jonah's not looking quite as bad when we look at ourselves, right? I was just saying that in Sunday school. We were looking at Israel, and it's so easy to pick on Israel. I'm like, oh my goodness, they're making a cow. They're, you know, not listening to God, and now they've got to wander through the desert. It's so easy to pick on Israel, but then when we look at ourselves, it's like, well, are we really much better? No, we're still human. We're still sinners. All right, question number three. Jonah was not spiritually prepared until it was too late. We already talked about that. Are you always in your word and praying? Are you in God's word and praying so that you're prepared when God asks you to do that big thing? Are you spiritually ready, putting on the full armor of God? Are you, like Danny, training to be a boxer or you know, being ready to take the punches that life will throw at you, that God will throw at you, so that when somebody is sick, when you're sick, when you lose a loved one, You'll be able to stand in your faith and be strong. I hope this is the case for most people. But do we do this 100% of the time? Are we always prepared when something bad happens? No. So we need to be spiritually prepared, spiritually fit. All right, question number four. Only when Jonah surrendered to God was he blessed with results. So up until the point that Jonah finally was like, okay, Lord, I'll follow you, I'll go to Nineveh. Did he accomplish anything? Because up until that point, Jonah was like, I'm going to do things my way, my way. I'm going to get on this ship. I'm going to try and convince the sailors, you know, I'll try and, they'll try and row back to the shore. I can do this myself and run away from God. Or if we try to do a ministry, if we apply this to ourselves, I'll try and do this ministry and I'll try to sing in the praise team and give it my all. But if we're not doing it to the Lord, that's not a genuine thing that we're doing. We're not surrendering to him. I'm going to try and teach, but I don't really need to pray beforehand and be in a right relationship with the Lord. I'm just going to do it because I've been in church all my life and I'm really smart. You need to surrender to the Lord before he will start blessing you with results. Not that Jonah saw that as much of a uh, blessing, the results of Nineveh being saved, but that's when something actually happened that was good in the story. Question number five, and this is talking right about Jonah chapter four. Jonah cared more about his physical well-being than the people heading towards destruction. So how many times in the New Testament and the Bible in general talk about not clinging on to possessions and not focusing on money and things that you have. When God sends out the disciples, he tells them to take just a few things to travel, but don't take an extra pair of clothes, don't take a bunch of money. You don't need all that stuff. What you need to do is what God tells you to do. And you need to tell people that they are heading towards destruction. You don't need to think, oh, well, I'll, I'll really serve the Lord if I can just, you know, get this set up in my life. If I'm comfortable with, you know, where I am financially and, you know, I, I am fo my job is a little more hectic, maybe I can serve the Lord a little bit more. Maybe if I'm feeling less stressed in my day-to-day -day life, I can do more things at church or share the, have that person over that the Lord has been prompting me to share the gospel with. Maybe when I'm a little less busy, then I'll do it. But we got to recognize that those people in our lives and even here in this story, are headed towards destruction. These people, if they had continued in their sinful ways and God had destroyed them at that time, 
they would have all gone to hell. They would have gone to Hades and then to hell, but they, they would have all gone to eternal punishment and suffering. Same thing happens today. If one of your friends that you know is unsaved and you're like, I really think maybe I should be you know, sharing the gospel with them, but I'm just too busy. I don't have time. And then something happens. They're in a car accident. You know, Something horrible happens. You recognize that their destination is the same destination that Nineveh had being rebellious against God. All right, and the last one here, which I'll take a few moments to talk about. God shows mercy and grace to Jonah and the city of Nineveh when they do not deserve it. So God keeps showing, first off, he showed mercy and grace to Nineveh by even saying these horrible, wicked people that are constantly rebelling against me and following up their gods and should be destroyed I'm going to send a prophet to them so they can hear the truth and not be destroyed. That's mercy and grace right there. He's shown mercy and grace to Jonah by when he decided, I'm going to kill myself by jumping off this ship. God saved him with the fish. And Jonah even recognizes this in chapter 2. Or when Jonah is sitting out in the desert, God gives him a plant. He shows him mercy and grace. He's trying to get Jonah to repent like Nineveh did. Let's flip over to Ephesians, because let's talk about the mercy and grace that we are shown when we do not deserve it. So Ephesians chapter 2, it should be up there. We're going to read this chunk. So, so far I don't know if any of you guys answered no to those questions, but I would answer yes to all of them for myself personally, that I am... Even though I don't want to admit it, I am very much like a Jonah. Great. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Nineveh was dead in trespasses and sin, but God saved them. They didn't die. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, talking about Satan, the spirit who does not work, in the sons of the spirit now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as the others so we could also see that a little bit put that in the place of Nineveh right they were following satan by following all their false idols and actively pushing against God, and it's also applying to our lives, right? We all are fighting against God. Before we were saved, we were an enemy of God. We were under his wrath. We were children of wrath, and we were children of Satan, our father, the devil, right? He's the king of lies, and we were liars and sinners before. We're still liars and sinners, but thankfully by grace, which we're about to get into in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy... There's that word again, which was mentioned in Jonah. Jonah was scared of God's mercy to Nineveh. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, so we were dead in our sin because of the bad things that we had done, he made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that shows us that ultimately, did Nineveh deserve God's mercy even after they repented? No. Because up until that point, they had been an enemy of God. God showed them mercy when they did not deserve it. Did Jonah deserve to get swallowed by a fish and saved? Or should God have just let him drown in the water and is like, you aren't following me anyways. This is what you want. Here you go, I'm giving it to you. But God, because he's merciful 
And ultimately, there are, there are a lot of words there that Jonah says to God, but like accusingly, your mercy, your loving kindness, your grace is why you saved Nineveh. God is the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New. But here it has uh, sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Here we have the hope of Jesus Christ. The fact that we were dead in our trespasses, we were just like Nineveh, heading for a destination which we rightfully deserved because we were rebelling against God. We just listed a bunch of things that we agree, I've been like Jonah in that way. I've been like Jonah in that way. Those things are all sin. All of that stuff is sin, and therefore we should be condemned because God is a just judge. He says, if you break my law, if you do not listen to me, if you break the, my rules... You will be punished, and you will go to eternal torment. But, which I think my dad says this quite a lot, the, one of the most amazing phrases in the Bible is, but God, because it'll list all these things about how you're a horrible sinner, you don't deserve God's mercy, you deserve his wrath, and then, but God showed us grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. He sent his sinless son to die for us, who going through that list of things that we were like a Jonah, we were like a Jonah in this way, in that way. Jesus was never like a Jonah. He always listened to God. He always did what his father told him to do. He always talked to the people that the Holy Spirit prompted him to talk to. He never ran away from God's will. He stuck on the path to head towards the cross, ultimately a destination of pain and suffering for us so that we can have that mercy and grace imputed onto us because of the death of Christ. So, final thought. I know I talked a lot, almost as much as a Rodney. But final thought, it's a little silly, but I want us to keep thinking about, because we went through that list, this idea, and the title of the sermon was, um, Are You Like a Jonah? Final thought, let's keep thinking about being less like a Jonah and more like Christ. So look at the things that Rodney preaches about in John and the way that Jesus consistently follows the Father and consistently goes to the lost and goes outside of his comfort zone. We have to recognize Jesus was fully God and fully man. Some of those interactions were most likely uncomfortable. Him to go talk to a prostitute, somebody that somebody of his stature probably wouldn't talk to, so the human side might have been like, this is what God wants me to do. I got a little bit of butterflies, but I'm going to do it. We don't know exactly how. I don't want to say that for a fact. But he, he did God's will, and that's what we need to do. That's ultimately the point of Jonah, is God showing mercy to those that don't deserve it and to follow God's will even when we don't want to. All right, let's uh, pray, and then we will uh, take the Lord's Supper. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Jonah, that even through his sinful ways and his rebellion, you have a beautiful story, ultimately beautiful history here in the word of God and your word that shows us somebody that is very similar to us, somebody that struggles with following your will, somebody that stumbles time after time, but somebody that finally finds success even though it might not have been something he wanted, he finally finds success when he surrenders to you and he recognizes that your mercy is not just for him, but it's for all of those that are unbelievers, that are enemies of you. We are all enemies of you, Lord, and we know that it's only by your grace and your mercy through Jesus Christ when we were not worthy, you died for us. You sent our, your son to die for us giving us a grace and a mercy that is beyond imagination, your sinless son living a perfect life, following you every single step of the way. Lord, help us to just focus on Jesus and to memorize the things that he's done and apply them to our lives so that we can be the Christians that you've called us to be. Because, Lord, we know that if we really love Jesus, ultimately loving you because Jesus is you, Lord that we will keep your commandments. And your commandments are to go and preach the word and 
share the gospel and to be in the Bible and serve at church and all the things that we find in your word, Lord. Help us to follow you and to forever remember that we are only saved by your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.